All right. So, hey, guys, sorry about that. Talk about technical difficulties. Has anybody experienced that ever in their lives? Yes, of, of course. Um, the What's that famous saying, the best laid plans of mice and men or something? Is that from that, of mice and men? Does anyone know that? Um, so, just quickly to introduce myself, we're already 10 minutes into our time together, so my apologies. Um, my name's Judy Hopkins. I lead internships for the College of Agricultural, Human, and Natural Resource Sciences here at Washington State University. I've worked for about 10 years at uh, WSU actually leading internships and professional development at the Academic Success and Career Center, which is our central career services here at WSU. So um, that's my history and background. I had the opportunity to take a course from, um, uh, and, and, it, and a number of different materials that have been compiled together for this particular presentation which uh, I've probably been working on putting this material together for the last couple of years. So I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity. And one of the things I do ask of all of you is, and, and when you're also with us uh, globally, so wherever you are globally, I'm gonna ask this of you as well. We wanted to move you together because during the time we have our conversation and I'm presenting, we're gonna have a chance for you to do some talk and turning and have some conversation with that friends near you. So is that something that you are willing to do? Do a little talk and turn? Okay, perfect. Um, because that's gonna be what will help this to be a more meaningful experience for you. So here we go. All right, next, arrow, forward, can you help me? Yeah, it's not moving forward with the arrows. <laughs> Up or down? Just have it. Yeah. Okay. Make sure you try to click on the background. Okay. Oops, oops, not like that though. There we go. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Wow. The background for this presentation comes from a course taught by Dr. Lori Santos. She is a professor at Yale University, and this course was first taught in 2018. What she noticed was that students in her college were really troubled with depression, with anxiety, with worries and fears and difficulties in sort of navigating their lives. So she took it upon herself to gather a huge amount of information. And what I have today, I actually have some handouts here. And for those of us who are with, uh, with us globally, I. Um, have sent this information also to the leadership conference. So you'll be able to get the slides and all of the research associated with each of the slides that I'll be talking about. So if the background and a little bit of research on your own is something of interest to you, then you'll be able to access that. And it's right here uh, in the handouts that I have. Okay, um, so this is what you'll be able to expect from our time together today. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to enhance the well-being of students that you interact with. How many of you are involved in relationships and leadership positions that create an opportunity for you to interact with other peers? Lots of people here, right? You are all in leadership positions. So today, this important information is gonna help you to be able to have a context, to be able to support and encourage the peers around you. But not only your peers around you, but we're gonna talk about some misbeliefs that many young adults who have been surveyed in the last number of years think about what will make them happy and then learn and be able to actually implement several research-based methods that are simple and easy to 
to sort of engage in that are going to be practically of help to you. So in the end, we hope that your own happiness is going to be increased. Does that sound like a good thing to you? Yes, me too. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if anyone has seen this, uh, this diagram before, but there is an article uh, in the course called The G.I. Joe Fallacy. Knowing is half the battle, right? So how many of you have believed that knowing is half the battle? Right? Let's see if show of hands. I've, I'm sure I've said that lots of times in my life. But not so fast. Research has something different to tell us. So in this idea uh, that you've heard, knowing is half the battle, there are... Um, Truths that we have to begin to understand that our mind kind of plays tricks on us. So take a look at these two arrows. Which of these two arrows is longer, A or B? A or B? Or they're the same, right? They're, they're literally the same. Both of these arrows are exactly the same length. But because of the way they're configured with the endpoints, it plays tricks on us. Our minds play tricks on us. And people that are interviewed and asked this question, which arrow is longer, A or B, people will consistently say B because of the way the endpoints appear. So our, our mind just plays tricks on us even if we know what's true. So, one of the misconceptions that we're gonna take a look at today is the misconception about money and awesome stuff. So if we know that our minds play tricks on us a little bit and we can know things to be true that actually aren't true. That concept actually informs our way of thinking in lots of ways. So that's something to keep in mind. So what I'd like you to do right now is think about, fill in the blank. If only I had what? I would be happy. If only I had, fill in the blank. And when you've thought about it for a second, turn to a friend or turn to a neighbor and let them know what you've thought up. Go. If only I had. And those of us who are joining us globally, just think about it and write down, if only I had. All right, so what did you hear your, hear your friends say? What did they say? If only I had what? What? If only I had that iPad that I could win, right? Oh my gosh, that would be terrific. Uh, what else? If only I had what? Time, more time, yes. If only I had what? Anything else? Celebrity best friend, yes. My degree, if only I had my degree, I would be happy. So we have lots of ideas in our minds about things that might contribute to our happiness. And yet, this is what the author of the course has to say about um, the fallacies. When the unpredictable forces of emotion, habit, and situation reign, despite how much students know better, when it comes to behavior change, we have to step beyond simple knowing to emotional regulation, habit formation, deep practice, and the situations we place ourselves in. And this is where you, as coaches and peer mentors, come in. 
that you can help provide insight to those around you as you yourself gain insight and grow, right? Um, so some of these misconceptions that we're going to be talking about hopefully will gain some insight and understanding that you're going to be able to share with your friends and those you're on leadership teams with. And it's going to make a difference in your ability to move forward and actually in your happiness. Many of us believe, in fact, getting back to this misconception about money, that if we had lots of money, we wouldn't necessarily be perfectly happy, but we would be lots happier. Uh, even how many of you know the song uh, by Bruno Mars, I Want to Be a, Mil a Billionaire? Anybody, anybody familiar with that one? Yes. So it's a thing that, pe that we even sing about. Um, now, in regards to this topic of money and our beliefs about it and whether it will bring us happiness, there were a couple of Nobel Peace Prize winners in economics that asked a research question of 450,000 Americans, so a good group of folks, um, in um, 20, uh, 2008 and 9. As your salary goes up, does your happiness increase? That's an important thing, right? to be able to figure out. Their study showed that at low levels of income from $10,000, happiness measurements went up across three major dimensions. Positive affect, that means sort of mood and what your face looks like, not feeling blue or being, being stress-free, up until the point of about $75,000. And then guess what? After that, happiness levels pretty much remain the same, even as salaries increase significantly. Surprise. So that idea that making lots of money or having lots of money doesn't really pan out in the end. Money won't buy us happiness. Unless you're in a place of needing to put a roof over your head and food on the table, which is a thing, but once you have your basic needs met, money will not increase happiness. College students since the 1960s, so for decades, have been surveyed on this particular topic. And that's what our next slide takes a look at. All right, so this is the American Freshman Survey that um, was started in the 1960s. And as you can see, students entering college who say it is very important or essential to be very well off financially, um, started out in 1965 at about the 45% mark. So about 45% of students believed that being very well off financially was very important or essential. And then look through the decades up until about the 2000s, what happens? Almost 80% of students came to believe that being very well off financially was very important to essential. How about that? Does that align with some of your own thoughts or thoughts that you've heard people have, right? There's been this increasing sense that money is really super important especially among college students. But this is another really interesting uh, point of information. Again, in about 1965, there were, these students were asked about their belief being very important or essential in regard to the development of meaningful philosophy in their lives. About 80 plus percent of students believed that having the, developed a really meaningful philosophy of life was a really high value, over 80%. And then look what's happened over time in the decades, up to about the 2000s when this study was completed. What does this tell you? What's, some, what's important about this information? What do students believe to be true about finances? or money and the happiness that they might bring? 
and then philosophy of life and the meaning of life and developing a sense of value in that. It's pretty interesting, huh? Uh, there's also a book that I use as a resource called The Good Life. It's over here on the counter uh, or on the desk. And this Good Life um, book is a summary of an 85-year longitudinal study done, done by Yale. So, um, or excuse me, done by Harvard. And, um, and this study started with college students when they were 18 and 19 years old and followed them longitudinally through decades and now they're in their 80s. So an, literally an 85-year study. And this study also substantiates the idea that people across the U.S., so not just young adults, also have that same belief that, that money will buy happiness. All right, now here's another misconception that is important for us to address. That misconception about grades and college admissions. Admissions, sorry. So there is a study on uh, high, high school grade point average and overall uh, well-being. So the correlation between grade point average and the well-being of those individuals. Does happiness, so this is the question that researchers asked, does happiness go up as your grade point average increases? What do you think? You are absolutely correct. There is a correlation that was discovered in a study, but it is a negative correlation, so you're exactly right. On the average, as your high school GPA goes up, a student's well-being goes down. This also includes levels of optimism and self-esteem. Why do you think this might be true? Yes. Yeah. More work. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. So there's this increased pressure that we feel. Did you have something too? Okay. Yes. So there's this unfortunate correlation between more negative experiences. And the next study that we'll talk about has to do with correlations between beliefs about happiness gained in college admissions because there is this belief that good colleges improve the chances for good salaries. Is that something you thought to be true? Like if I can get into a good college, then I can get a good salary, right? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a common misbelief. So this study has to do with the correlation between grades made in college and starting salaries and how that grows over time. So this group of researchers did a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis means like they pooled together all of this data from a myriad of studies and then compiled that information. And this is what they discovered. Considering all the published studies, they found there was only an extremely low correlation between grades and salary growth, and a negative correlation between GPA and well-being. So if students find themselves, if you find yourselves, excessively worrying about your high school GPA or your GPA while you're here. But this is essentially students that were studied in high school because they believe they must get good grades to get into a good college to make a good salary. So all those connective beliefs. There just isn't a strong evidence to support this. And obviously, any student needs to make mini, you know, minimal grades um, and minimum requirements um, to get into a college program. But the correlation between grades and salary growth are just not there. Instead, what we do see is increasing GPA has lowering rates of well-being. The bottom line is getting good grades 
does not make you happier. It might succeed and have a higher. But <laughs> so just, you know, keep that in mind. That's a good thing to pay attention to. All right, here's another misconception. Are you ready? Any ideas about what it might be? Screen time and social media. Something else to consider is how we spend our leisure time and the questions we need to ask. Is the way we spend our leisure time contributing to our happiness? Much of the free time that individuals, adolescents have to spend on, um, you know, that's their free time, they spend on social media, right? Screen time, looking at videos, TikTok, Instagram, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And one of the earlier studies that was done um, in 2016 found that spending one hour per day on social networks reduced the probability of being completely satisfied with life overall by, wait for it, 14%. Is that surprising to you? It's pretty incredible, huh? So lots of studies have been done since, lots of social media happening, and uh, there have been compiled meta-analysis statistics as well, so that's pretty helpful to get, you know, compiled evidence. Um, this one particular group of researchers found that a, there was a small cor correlation, so a small negative correlation, between the time spent on social networking and well-being. Overall, social media doesn't make us as happy as we think. And I want to take a look at this slide to help us understand that. So this group actually did a study on the screen time and social media's active and passive use. So if you can see here, the solid line is the beginning of, of the baseline of individuals, and these are adolescents who um, their starting point was um, an average of about this 65% level of, of um, well-being, and it was just a measurement that they had with a number of questions that they asked. And it started out uh, at that point that you can see at the baseline, and then when the end of the use of social media occurred, at that, that post-manipulation, they did another measurement of well-being, and they found there was just a, a very slight increase of well-being. And then at the end of the day, you can see that there really wasn't much of a change in well-being. And this is active social media use, okay? Then if you take a look at that dotted line instead, you can see the baseline of those using social media started out slightly higher than those who were actively engaged. And then at post-manipulation, when they had completed the activities that they had been assigned to do, their well-being levels went down slightly. But look what happens at the end of the day after several hours. That sense of well-being plummets down significantly. And that's with passive use of social media. So it's then talk a little bit about the difference between passive and active social media use. So active social media use means a posting and engaging with others, commenting and chatting, um, that sort of thing. That's, that active engagement doesn't seem to really help, but you can see the outcome is not really hurting. It stays about the same as far as our of sense of well-being, but passive users not involved in social interactions such as just looking, viewing status updates, reading news feeds, viewing pictures were impacted more significantly 
and their mood lowered. You can see there is a small difference in well-being immediately after use by the end of the day by those passive users. Um, but those passive users had dropped significantly below those who were actively engaged. So those active users remained essentially the same um, as when they ended, um, when they ended their use. So the next question is regarding social media, how do students tend to use these sites? And researchers have found that students more often use sites in a passive rather than active way, exactly the way well-being is most impacted negatively. Now, I'd love for you um, to just give me a um, little wave. How many of you have experienced that, a, a little bit of a negative feeling at the end of passive use? Right? Yeah, let's just, just be honest. That's what it, that, and, and it's so valuable to understand that there's a distinctive difference between the two. So what might it look like for you to be actively engaged in social media? Like, what might that look like for you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so just some kind of a little bit of an interaction, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and um, sharing uh, different activities that you're uh, engaged in, talking about those activities, um, sending what my team does, the team that I'm a part of, um, we share pictures of the events that we participate in and we cheer each other on. Um, and that's, you know, like a team's chat. Um, so that's just one way that we can actively engage in um, and make a difference in that social media use. All right. So, if our intuitions about our wants are false, what then? If we won't be happier with the things <laughs> we think we want, and if we believe that genetics have too much influence, or life just sucks and trumps everything else, how can, how can this presentation be really about happiness? This is like not helpful, right? But uh, researchers have coined an important new term called miswanting that I think is so important for us to understand what that means. Miswanting, according to their definition, is the act of being mistaken about what and how much you will like something in the future. How many of you have had something that you really, really wanted, and then you actually, when you got it, it didn't bring you that much happiness? Yeah? Right? What were examples? What were those things? Anything? Yeah. It's okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. But I'll have it for a year, like I do my MacBook, and maybe it won't be as important mm. of an item. But it's just like I don't want it to be actually something that I actually really want. Yeah. There you go. Good. <laughs> Such good ways of thinking. Um, Dr. Santos, the one who uh, directed the course, summarizes that our brains delivering to us the idea that we want a certain thing. But we are wrong about it, and we are constantly miswanting. Think about this for a bit. How many of us is this true about? 
how many of us can identify things that we thought, oh my gosh, that is going to make me so happy? And then, within a pretty short amount of time after we've gotten it, it doesn't bring us the same happiness. There's a term for this. It's called hedonic adaptation. And hedonic adaptation is the process that occurs when we acclimate to that new thing quite readily. And then it doesn't bring us the same amount of happiness. Hedonic adaptation has to do with things, with wanting things. But there's a way to counteract hedonic adaptation. And that's the next thing we're going to talk about. There is a happiness chart, thankfully, uh, that some researchers have put together. And uh, in fact, there's this set point. Remember we were talking about of what we believe about genetics. Like, dang, 50% or like, there's, there's so much of genetics is in play, and there's n nothing that I can do to make changes be because of the gen just the genetics in place. Well, research shows that generally, researchers agree that the genetic set point is at about 50%. So about 50% of our genetics sort of is set, sets us in place. So... Yeah, we're, we're right about, about that to the degree of about 50%. Then, unique individual circumstances make up about 10% of our happiness factor. So those can be a wide variety of things that are unique just to you. But take a look at that orange part of the pie chart. That is a full 40% of intentional activity is under your control. Personal actions, habits, thoughts, ways that you engage in the world. So 40% of our ability to experience happiness is ours, is under our control, that we have the ability to make a difference in. And I hope that is a perspective that's helpful for you. In the course, Dr. Santos spends a significant amount of time creating opportunities for students in the class to be able to rewire their brains in ways that will contribute to happiness. This rewirement experience, or ex these rewirement experiences, are really ways that our synaptic pathways are developed over time. So think of it like when the very first time you try something, it's quite a bit harder to do. A little bit similar to, um, I think of it like I'm just picturing in my mind at like an ox cart or something like heavy and, um, and, and it doesn't move very easily and you're on a path that's hardly been, that maybe it's never been uh, a pathway before. And it takes a lot of energy to push forward on that. But once you get it going, once you push and, and get, the, get the energy behind it and uh, just take a little bit uh, extra effort, then you get it going and then it can move forward. And then just like synaptic behavior, as the pathway begins to be created, the more times you do it, the stronger the pathway is. So that's a really important way of thinking about rewirement and the activities that we engage in. So it's harder to get started, but the more you do it, the, the stronger that pathway is. It's like taking a small path and it becoming um, a paved path, and then it becomes a road, and then it becomes a highway, and then it becomes a freeway, and then it, be does that make sense, right? It's this very well-established path that commonly takes a bit of extra effort to get going. But one of these rewirement practices 
is the idea of a gratitude journal. So a gratitude journal can be started in just a few minutes, five to 10 minutes. And the next week you could do that. It's an opportunity to thoughtfully consider and reflect on words and phrases that you can focus on. This is a chance for you to show intention. And even just a word or a phrase to really focus on, to appreciate, can be helpful. And actually writing them down in a gratitude journal has shown to be helpful. Give it a try in the next week. There is also the art of savoring. This is one of my favorite things. The art of savoring is the ability to appreciate a situation. And if you have uh, thought about this before, it's, um, it's a practice, um, it's called meta-processing or meta-thinking when you sort of step outside of that thing and look at it and reflect on it and think more deeply about it. So that's what savoring is. What I'd like you to do right now is to think of an experience that you've had and turn to your neighbor and tell them that story of that experience, an experience that made you happy, okay? So that's the assignment. Quick turn and talk, tell your neighbor an experience that made you happy. Go. Okay, did any, what were some of the stories that people heard that made them happy? Stories that made people happy. Any? Yes. <laughs> Your cat was snuggling you so hard that you couldn't leave. Awesome. Another story that made you happy. Any other stories? Yes. Two deer coming out, ah, walking in. Do you, do you feel like you heard Snow White singing? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So the amazing thing about telling our stories, um, as we reflect on stories of our own experiences, it brings us back to places of happiness. And guess what it does for the listener? It does the same thing. So I don't know if you noticed this in the room, but as people were telling their stories, that energy of happiness raised in the room because we were telling one another stories that made us happy and it also made our listeners happy. So remember, that's something you can do anytime, any day. Now, we got a really late start, so um, uh, I won't have time to talk about the rewirement of healthy practices, but... Um, That's, of course, something we're very familiar with. Um, Sleep studies, this is so critical that you understand having good sleep is restorative. And even uh, if you lose sleep, even one good night's sleep the next night is going to help restore your levels of well-being. Testing improved after a night's sleep as opposed to uh, prep and testing during the day. And researchers advocate napping for a cognitive boost, so keep that in mind. Um, Better wanting, remember we were talking about miswanting. A way of paying attention to that is using our strengths. So 
think about our strengths, think about the strengths that you use to engage in the world and the way you exercise your leadership, the way you uniquely are engaged in the world. Remember to use your strengths. The more you use your strengths, the higher our well-being will be impacted. And then more social connection, practicing meditation, engaging in acts of kindness. And I'll just end with this. This rabbit effect is based on a book called uh, Live Longer and Happier with the Groundbreaking Science of Kindness. Um, Dr. Kelly Harding uh, is a uh, physician at Pre the Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. And they did this research on rabbits where all of them were meant to be sick. And, and, um, and this small cohort of bunnies were flourishing, and they didn't know why. So they dug deeply and began to ask questions about, well, what made the difference in this group, in this smaller cohort of bunnies? And guess what they discovered? They discovered that the caretaker of those particular bunnies held them, spoke to them kindly, embraced them, encouraged them. The kindness of that caretaker was the only difference that made them flourish in their health. Otherwise, they shouldn't have been healthy. It's something for us to remember, those acts of kindness that we call random aren't really, they're very powerful ways that we can interact with the world. Research has even shown kind, thoughtful actions, opening the door, saying hello to a stranger, has an impact in our well-being. So keep that in mind, and the well-being of that stranger as well. So is it ever too late to be happy? No, never. And here's a couple of quotes that I'll end on from The Good Life. Your ways of being in the world are not set in stone, more like sand that takes effort, but change can happen. Nothing that has happened in your life can keep you from connecting with others, from thriving or being happy. Meaningful change is always possible. Thank you.